Whether you call it urban air mobility or advanced air mobility, some are saying that a revolution is coming to aviation that will transform the way people and things move around using new aircraft with complicated sounding names like EVATOL, ESTOL, and even ECTOL. So to help us cut through the jargon and understand what the new forms of aviation will mean in practice, we sat down with aviation consultant Daryl Swanson, who's working with other technical experts to build the ecosystem these new aircraft will need. Uh, UAM, Urban Air Mobility, uh, and Urban Air Mobility tends to deal with EV tall, so electric vertical takeoff uh, and landing. The full long name is Distributed Electric Propulsion Vertical Takeoff and Landing, but we shortened it to EV tall because it's multiple motors. Um, on the advanced air mobility side, which covers uh, fixed wing electric aircraft and uh, and uh, EV tall, um, the E stall is uh, electric short takeoff and landing. And EC tall is electric conventional takeoff and landing. And the only real difference between EC tall and E stall is that the short takeoff and landing is designed to take off on very short uh, airfields. And that's actually quite important because there are more airfields out there uh, with short runways that are closer to passengers' origins and destinations than large airports uh, with great surface access. Uh, whereas E C tall conventional will just take off on a regular runway, and uh, they they might have a, a field length requirement of greater than, say, 800 to 1,000 meters or or a little bit more, uh, depending on the size of them. Some of the new aircraft only have rotors, while others have what look like conventional wings. So, what's the reasoning behind those differences? Because your wing is generating lift, you need less energy uh, to take off and and continue your flight. Uh, so that means that you have an ability to fly further distances with a greater payload. So that's why uh, E-STAL and e tall aircraft will have the longer ranges. Um, and this is why some configurations of ev tall, you'll either have a multi-copter where it's kind of like a, a helicopter with multiple props on it, all trying to keep you up, but that's very energy intensive. Uh, whereas you have certain types of ev tall that have uh, a tilt something configuration so uh, either the wing will tilt or a motor will tilt, uh, and then you'll uh, transition on to uh, wing-borne flight. There's also something called lift uh, and cruise. So you'll have a, a series of lifting uh, propellers that will get you up to altitude, but again, you'll transition on to horizontal flights uh, for a wing. And I kind of suspect that the industry will start to transition towards some kind of an EV tall concept that includes wings because it just gives you the operating economics uh, of more range and more speed uh, with less power. Uh, and it's actually interesting because we're starting to see that convergence uh, in the industry and in that uh, there's a reason why airplanes look like airplanes and it's because of the economics of them. The new aircraft, mostly powered by electricity or at least with hybrid electric propulsion, are set to expand the parameters of transportation in and around and potentially between cities. Most of the OEMs out there are looking to develop uh, vehicles that carry between, say, two and six passengers, although the Skybus project that I'm working on can take up to, to 50 passengers. But we're really looking for uh, the opportunities to move people over those distances where the use cases uh, make sense, uh, which means uh, because it's vertical, we can land in city centers, which is actually closer to where passengers want to go. I would suggest that uh, advanced air mobility complements uh, public transportation modes. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit wary when people say it's going to replace thousands of cars uh, on the road. And, and there may be cases where you have a reduction in, in, uh, in ground traffic. Uh, but advanced air mobility is going to complement existing modes of transport. You might get some shifts uh, in people switching from different modes. So you might get some people switching off of uh, rail over longer distances onto EV toll because it's faster uh, and because they're closer to their destination in the city center. They may not use a bus or an underground system. So it's really about getting people closer to where they want to go in the end. So yes, there will be a reduction of some vehicle traffic, but not huge amounts. But again, it has to complement and not compete with public transportation. You, you can get somewhere between 15 and 150 uh, statute miles. Um, if you're metric, that could be up to 300 kilometers, according to Lilium and some of the stuff that they're doing. But a lot of that is actually driven by the architecture of the vehicle. Uh, so something like Volocopter, where you have a multi-copter uh, configuration, which is similar to a drone, you'll have it shorter uh, ranges. Uh, and that's just because you're putting all the power into keeping yourself in the air. 
where it's something that gets you vertical and then transition on to the wings, uh, that gives you a lot more range. What's been driving a lot of this is actually battery technology. So as we've been developing uh, electric cars uh, and electrifying uh, automobiles, um, the energy density in the battery um, has really risen to a point where some of these use cases uh, start to, to become available. Uh, and it really is about the use case. So the technology, uh, the battery technology uh, is enabling uh, all of this. Uh, the motor technology gets better and it really is about the use case and the use case will be wrapped around the technology. So the technology will enable so much that can be done for that technology and then another technology will come along uh, and then you'll be able to wrap a different set of use cases around that. So we will find the, the right use cases. The challenge is actually trying to make sure that the use cases are useful for society. I, I think in the early days, um, business travelers will be the first users uh, of uh, EV toll operations or advanced air mobility. And that's that's no different from the evolution of commercial aviation. In the early days of uh, commercial aviation, it was usually high net worth individuals um, whose time was worth a lot uh, or business travelers who would adopt these new modes of transport because it enabled them to do more than they could uh, currently do. So I, I see that uh, initially, but as the industry evolves, I, I can see more and more of society uh, being able to access this mode of transport as this cost starts to come down and the cost will come down when you get more vehicles in the air and more verdi ports uh, available for operation. So competition just naturally sets in. So I kind of suspect that we'll see the evolution of the current uh, commercial aviation system happen over a very short period of time um, as we get more and more vehicles and uh, operating locations into the system. In the UK, for instance, Daryl and his colleagues are working on something called Skybus, which would have a much larger capacity than most of the other new designs being brought to market. The idea is what is the, the system of systems that needs to be put in place to enable a large uh, EV tall concept. So in, in this case, we're looking at a vehicle that might be between 50 and uh, sorry, 30 and 50 passengers uh, in total. So it is going to be a very large vehicle. So we're, we're looking at uh, what the business model is uh, that's going to be behind it. What does the infrastructure look like? Where do you place these types of, uh, of vehicles? What are the use cases? What's the concept of operations? In a new paper called Distributed Aviation, Daryl has tried to imagine some of the specific use cases for advanced air mobility in a country like the UK, which has just over 66 million people. He's looked at 15 different routes that might be viable for these new aircraft. And each of those 15 routes, we found that there's probably just so much latent demand that the demand is always going to be there for, for that mode of transport, for people to, to do those trips, uh, which are a lot faster than uh, they would normally be able to do. So there's gonna be latent demand, uh, but then we'll start to induce demand uh, as we get to volume and the price comes down. But it's not just people who need moving. There's potential to reshape the freight business too. And there's a lot of different use cases out there uh, looking specifically at cargo. Uh, and there are places around the world where it's just extremely difficult uh, to get cargo. So if you think uh, Alaska or other places that are remote, uh, vertical flight offers you uh, an opportunity to, to transport goods um, and have a very low uh, infrastructure spend on the ground. So cargo does make a lot of sense. Um, and how you integrate that into city verdi ports is actually quite interesting. Uh, and it's something that we've been struggling with uh, on the Skybus project. But uh, there, there are solutions out there for it. But it is definitely a, a very strong uh, early contender. I'm looking at uh, vehicles that can carry several hundred kilograms of, of, of cargo. And that's where it really starts to become uh, commercially interesting. The other thing that uh, will make it really interesting is when you have autonomous operation of these vehicles. So if you take the pilot out of the equation, one, you're freeing up somewhere of uh, 100 kilograms worth of extra payload that you can put onto the vehicle. Uh, but two, you're also reducing a lot of the operational costs associated with, with paying that pilot. You still have the uh, infrastructure requirements on either end of, of the origin and destination, but the, the ability to actually uh, transport cargo uh, over those distances is a significant opportunity. Working with NASA on its transformative vertical flight project, Daryl has been looking at other use cases that might seem to be higher priorities to some people. Working Group 1 uh, is specifically looking at uh, the public use cases 
uh, for eVTOL operations. So that centers around surveillance or firefighting or air ambulance uh, type operations. If you're able to have uh, an air ambulance that's able to, to land closer uh, to a victim uh, of an accident, uh, that just makes sense. And that could come about because these vehicles might have a, a, a smaller footprint. Um, additionally, much lower noise impact uh, on their communities, because right now, uh, most of the noise complaints uh, from helicopter operations in London are not actually due to high net worth individuals flying in and out to, to wherever to get their, uh, their corporate jet. It's actually down to police operations uh, and air ambulance operations, because they tend to hover uh, in place for, for long periods of time, either whether they're looking for um, a bad guy uh, or they're, they're looking for a place to land to, to help save somebody's life. So again, the, these early use cases uh, will make a big difference uh, to the public acceptance side. Maybe not in the early stages of advanced air mobility, but perhaps in the longer term, autonomous flight, meaning aircraft flown without pilots on board, could further transform the use cases for the new aircraft. But this may well have to be introduced quite gradually. Overall, I, I believe that autonomy is the future. It's just going to take us time to get there. Uh, but the, the early adopters will be um, the, probably the cargo side of the operations because there isn't humans uh, being carried uh, for, for that. Uh, I, I think on, on the passenger side, uh, over time, you'll, you'll start to, to see less requirements for pilots or skilled pilots, and they may become more operators. So it'll be a gradual pace. But I think uh, the cargo operations uh, really offer the early opportunity to get to autonomy quickly, uh, and then we can start to prove the technology. And then the rest is just about uh, social acceptance. It could be that uh, autonomous uh, cargo drones uh, might carry things which are uh, more perishable uh, in nature, so fresh fruit and, and vegetables uh, or, or fish or, or meat products. Um, if you think about the, the, the carrying of organs, that's a, an early use case that has been proposed for uh, drones. Uh, the, the ability to, to get live uh, human organs um, from a, a donor to a recipient hospital uh, as quickly as possible is very important. So, again, it really comes down to the use case uh, for, for each of them. But I don't think that it will really replace uh, heavy good vehicles because, again, the, the, the cost of transport of of goods uh, is, is relatively low, but we might start to see some shift uh, in, in certain types of, of cargo that is being carried. Some of these companies want us and their investors to believe that these new aircraft could be in commercial service by 2024. That's less than three years away from now, and there's a lot of work to be done in terms of getting the aircraft approved by regulators and winning the trust and support of the communities in which they will operate. AIN's new futureflight.aero platform is trying to evaluate how this path to service entry might come to be and to make sense of the new aviation technologies and business models now coming to the fore. We're posting fresh news day by day. Subscribers get access to exclusive stories about what's happening throughout the industry and also to our extensive database of new aircraft programs and the companies behind them. You can subscribe for free to our weekly newsletter, which brings you highlights from the Future Flight world every Thursday. Well, we'll be posting more of these videos explaining the context for advanced air mobility. So thanks for watching this one. And please do find more of our coverage at futureflight.aero.